So, folks, can, can we ask you to uh, settle down? Uh, uh, we thought this was actually one of the most important parts of the two days in which uh, uh, you all uh, participate as opposed to listen, sit and listen. So please come along and participate. Let's give another couple of minutes. Actually, it's a good crowd. So, uh, yeah. Again, just once more, if you would like to kind of contribute to the overall discussion, which this next uh, 45 minutes at least is for, uh, please join us. Uh, contribute your comments publicly rather than privately. Let me introduce Professor Caden, uh, Gerald Caden, uh, former chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design, uh, a long-standing member of the faculty, uh, trained as a planner, trained as an attorney, but I still think of him as an urban designer as well, and perhaps he will lead uh, a conversation with you. Uh, 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 please speak your mind. Uh, in part, perhaps, in relationship to what you just heard or what you heard yesterday or what you may want to hear over the course of the rest of the day or in the sort of coming months ahead, uh, this is sort of your opportunity to express your opinion on things and especially on sort of matters related to urban design or urbanism, which is our dean's favorite word. Uh, so, Gerald. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um. Uh, so the idea is not for me to talk, uh, because this is your opportunity to talk. So I really have a uh, just a sort of functionary role, uh, which is I brought a two-minute uh, hourglass here, which I'll turn over when each person speaks. Uh, it's two minutes. Uh, by the way, when it runs out of sand, you don't get electrocuted or die or anything like that. But everybody else, at least, might see it. You know, I mean, it'll be sitting here, or at least I'll see it. And so if you feel that going beyond two minutes is really adding to the value of knowledge in society, please feel free to continue. Um, we'll all be judging you at that moment, thinking about it as every additional second goes by. Uh, that allows for, in 40 minutes or so, you know, 20 people potentially to speak, uh, but this is your opportunity. So without further ado, we have at least one person holding a microphone over there. Uh, when you start speaking, I will turn this over, and then it will run for two minutes. Hopefully most of your comments will be less than two minutes. We can get more of you engaged, but yes. Okay. So please raise your hand. That's all of my function. And uh, the minute you start speaking, the, the two-minute glass is turned over. Hello, good morning. My name is Alicia Guajardo. I'm from Mexico. I graduated from the Master in Urban Planning in 97, and I have an architectural background. And um, I'm very happy to be with you here and to, um, to have the chance to, to say hello to you, Gerald Caden, to Alex, and to all of the professors um, that I took class before. So I guess the question that I have, uh, it's uh, a little bit about how can we achieve a good balance between uh, an exceptional urban design uh, that we deliver um, and responding to a um, political and commercial expectation. Uh, just to hear a little bit of what uh, it was mentioned before, Spella mentioned that a project was killed just because of politics. And then Rogers sort of like mentioned a little bit that, that uh, they succeed with the target um, uh, thing about commercial issues. So how um, can we reach this balance? Because politics and investment has its own agenda. And um, how, I guess the question is, how do we teach political leaders towards good uh, urbanism? Or how can we sort through adverse conditions and reach design success? Um, politicians and investors just speak a different language. And uh, they are moved by different factors. Uh, so how do we fight for it and how far? How do we compromise uh, to public expectation and how much? And uh, well, I guess this is uh, just some comments about, like, just to reflect, since I was, um, in some point, I, I face these things, and I guess all of us, we face uh, every day with these decisions. So thank you. Great. Terrific. Good thing I have two hour glass, two minute glasses, because I can start this one up. You have extra time that you can transfer through transfer of development rights to somebody else. See, this is my little plug for implementation as being a crucial part of urban design practice and thinking and research as well. Transfer of development rights. Anyway, next question, next comment, please. Andreas, uh, let's go over there. 
We all heard a great number of really intriguing, interesting, mysterious, exotic, clever, a lot of intelligence this morning. The only thing, I didn't hear a single statement I haven't heard in two days that was actually banal. There's a banality deficiency at Harvard. And unfortunately, when you're doing urban design, a very, very high proportion of what goes on is banal. It has to do with ordinary people's ordinary daily lives. Those of us who practice in this know that what we saw today is actually, if you do get it, a tiny bit of froth on top of what is essentially banal. And I wonder whether there's any interest whatsoever in banality at Harvard, and perhaps it's the one exotic thing that's left to be talked about. Go ahead, Richard. Hi. Uh, microphone, please. I think you, I, I don't want to speak for this, uh, the, the many, many talks this morning, but I, uh, I think in a number of the presentations. Richard, I, could you put the mic closer I think, to you? Uh, in a number of the presentations, I'll just go with the last one because it's the freshest in my mind from Roger Sherman, that uh, uh, he's looking very much at the everyday conditions of Los Angeles and, 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 and what's happening in those areas. Uh, the project actually reminded me a little bit of the um, uh, of uh, Venturi's um, Thousand Oaks project. Uh, in, in its attempt to capture a, a, a kind of large, banal landscape. Uh, and uh, the, the, the question you, that I think you want, want to pose, Andreas, about, about what about the 90% or the 98%, uh, I, think, I, I, th I think is a relevant one. But as you know, uh, it's, not so, it's, not, it, it's not so useful to say, well, Architects and design, urban designers with ambition are only involved in the two percent. Uh, the the bigger question is if we have environmentalists, engineers, zoning lawyers, all the people who are actually uh, the constellation of uh, of, of uh, professional experts that are actually designing the built environment. How do we how do we uh, inject or give the uh, ambitious uh, designers and architects agency in that constellation? Of, of work that has to occur. Now, you've been very effective at doing it, but I, I, uh, in your own way, but I, I don't think it, it helps to just sort of draw a black and white distinction between high architecture, high urban design, and everything else. I, I think the situation is much more gray in, in, in the sense of how we as, as uh, citizens and as thinkers uh, actually get agency in all those forces, whether it's you know the, the concrete lobby, which you've talked about, or, or, or working with zoning engineers to actually make some of the projects we saw this morning happen. And I think it's, uh, you know, we, we couldn't get up in the morning and do what we do if we didn't think that was possible. Andreas, do you want to respond to that? Perfectly good answer was what was said. Does anybody else want to continue and this thread? Minutes, which is amazing. For uh, you. If you want to, we'll, we'll, we'll have one or two more comments on this thread and then move on to, to another subject. Anybody else on yeah. this particular thread? I have, thread I have the microphone please. right now. I just want to Stand say one up, thing. Stand up, identify oh. yourself. Sherry Cutler. Uh, I just wanted to say that one place where you do get the banal and I haven't heard it mentioned, is uh, community participation, which was a huge thing back when I was here in the 60s, and the whole urban design process was to incorporate community participation. So that's, that's where I see it coming. Anybody else on this thread? Yes, sir. And then identify yourself, please. Well, yeah, my name is stand Danny. up, please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I, just to sort of expand on this thing about b banality, I think uh, I think a, a, a lot of, uh, especially the, the the later projects in the in the previous panel, were dealing with what we like to call sort of uh, architectural alchemy. This idea that you can actually take traditional ingredients uh, and by mixing them together in untraditional rela relationships, you can create, if not gold, then at least sort of uh, added value, and and then I think that that by by sort of selecting, you know, what what appeared to be sort of a uh, Traditional social housing, uh, some energy production, uh, some uh, some commercial programs, some parking lots. It turned into this sort of wonderful, almost utopian uh, mixture of essentially really banal ingredients. So, so I think um, it, it was one of these examples where you can take the 99% of banality and actually, by mixing it in an interesting way, turn it into to gold. 
Yeah, I, I, by the way, I don't think it's the banal. I don't think you really mean the word banal anyway. We can, uh, you're talking about the day-to-day, -day, the real, you know, again, recognizing that real can mean a lot of different things. Um, yes, Marshall. I mean, I have a question really to start the next thread since, uh, and it's directed actually towards uh, Bjarke. Um, there was, in your project, there's an interesting way that at the beginning, when you're dealing with this question of the car, there's a sort of what if uh, way of thinking, which I think is uh, really powerful in terms of, especially this question of futurity, which showed up in, in, in many ways in all the projects. What, what if, which allows the, f the, the way of thinking about the future to actually explode into multiple futures, perhaps. But then, as the project uh, proceeds, it, the thinking seems to shift from what if to if then, which I'd say is maybe less uh, based on plausible scenarios, but a kind of desire um, which maybe is more architectural. So I want to ask a direct question about to, to Bjarke for, you know, the degree to which you find that uh, your kind of architectural desires, which are, let's say, more singular uh, and result in more, more kind of singular, those spectacular proposals, despite their scale, are actually kind of fragile from the point of view of urbanism because they do require such a specific chain of events to actually be, um, let's say, say, realized, whereas the what if is really about something which is more dispersed and, and, and less singular. Um, Ron, uh, do you want to do you want a response? Or, so, go ahead. Go ahead. Feel free to answer. Uh, no, but like I, I think. Uh, um, I mean, I mean, I think what what we what we tried to do was to sort of take to the extreme this sort of uh, the the possibility of a. Uh, like in a way, this sort of almost utopian uh, vision of of a city as this like really interactive uh, domain that is really sort of f through uh, through technology and through very plausible uh, developments uh, in technology uh, that um, uh, that in a way is sort of like this way of empowering the people and imagine that instead of like crystallizing a function and restricting sort of public behavior uh, to Im imagine like in a, in, a, in an extreme scenario. Uh, this sort of much more sort of a hedonistic uh, use of, uh, of of urban space, and and I think it, it doesn't necessarily require um, like this sort of universal application. I, th I think rather than than what we are looking at now is I think in a sort of Audi context we will do some form of a. It could even be something as lame as a as a sort of Audi vendor where we'll sort of try to deploy part of the, the technology, uh, but uh, but I think. Um, Bruce Mao said uh, when when uh, when they were working on this sort of massive massive change exhibition, uh, this one thing that I that I really believe profoundly, and he he was saying like design the most the most. So if you can do some like interesting facade jobs with some photovoltaics, it's not going to mean anything because it's like these sort of tiny little interventions or like uh, picture poems. But whereas if you can sort of uh, something like the highways or like the the pavements of our cities or like stuff that really sort of exist in abundance, if you can sort of Im imbue that or impregnate that with, with attribute, then, uh, then there's like a much more massive potential for, for, for development. And um, so therefore, I don't, I don't necessarily see that, that, um, that we sort of fall into the utopian. It's more like sort of trying to plug into some of the forces that are, that are already there and, and that are really sort of powerful. Thank you. Uh, Ron Fleming. Ron, can you wait for one moment? I was, I was going to stretch this from the banal to the bad <clears throat> and, and think about not what if, but what now. Um, so many spaces that have been built in the last 40 years have failed, uh, and they've been built by good designers. Uh, I can think of Holyoke Center's uh, space, where there was an enormous level of naivete about how people would actually use that space, and it was it was gradually redesigned, or across the river, the new uh, uh, business school plaza done by one of the faculty, which I, I can't see ever seen anybody use as a plaza. So my question is, uh, this is a question I asked last night, and, and you said it wasn't being taught here. To what extent can we teach about mistakes? Uh, to what extent can we do a post-occupation -occup evaluation of public space and isn't the search for the new, the search for the uh, new exploration of design, often get in the way of the education about what exists and how we can do it better? Could I, could I make a suggestion? Uh, this is your opportunity to make statements. 
if there are specific questions, we'll try to collect them and then towards the end of the uh, uh, session, maybe try to re have some of the panelists respond. But this is, these are, you, 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 there are 200 brilliant former alums and several hundred students as well. This is your, your opportunity to make statements rather than just ask uh, us or the panelists questions. But we'll try to record some of those questions until later on. Yes, right. Yes, right. But I had a great answer for you, Ron. Okay. <laughs> My name is Mina Marifat, and I'm an MAUD graduate at GSD, but also a historian from MIT. Um, I just want to make a statement about um, the use of the word urban design. It may be only 50 years old in terms of a profession, but it's been in practice forever, time immemorial. And I take you back to 1893 with the World's Columbian Exposition, where a few architects and urban designers, planners, whatever you want to call them, transformed and had indelible impact on urban design and city shape the way we see it today just in America and then in the rest of the world. Um, then you had the World's Fairs that continued to do that, uh, proposing innovations, and the 1939 um, New York World's Fair was an incredible example of foreseeing the future with the use of the automobile. So I think that bearing in mind history and looking back at history, and perhaps in my own education at uh, the GSD, I feel that history was lacking, and that took me to MIT and a whole profession in history. But I think that it's really important to bear in mind the lessons we learned from history also not to repeat our mistakes, and not to spread our mistakes all across the world. And if we look at Africa and Asia, we are doing that. Thank you. You, then you, then you, then Bill Doble, and we'll keep going back. Uh, my name is Tony Ellison. Um, I'm, a di I'm director of a, uh, a large program at Rutgers in planning public policy and public health. Uh, I graduated here in 68 uh, with uh, Roger Transick as uh, one of my classmates. And we had a, this opportunity to spend a lot of time with CERT, so it's kind of interesting to be back here. One of the things that project was, that Roger just covered very briefly, was this notion of, CERT's notion of kind of a humanism, this kind of pedestrian humanism, and try to integrating the newest technologies into what he saw at that time was the greatest scourge of the, in the United States, and that was suburban sprawl. Uh, how the country could come up with a prototype for a new uh, type of urbanism that really depended not so much on the car, but depended on as much as a balance between that and other things. Now, at the same time that I was here, and I'll go probably a little bit longer, there was a new awakening. And that was the early uses of computers. When we first came, we were the T-square guys, you know? And, and, and now the first computers came into line. And at that time, there was a couple extraordinary people here. Ben Thompson was here who did these really extraordinary image shows. And then there was, um, there was Charles Eames, who was a Norton a professor of poetry. And he started to show these multi-image visions of what the future could be and what it was now. And from that, I guess, all of you who are here take away extraordinary lessons from this place. And for me, it's been a lifetime quest of saying, what is the vision that other people have in their mind about what the future should be? And it's not the erudite, you know, very, very wonderful kind of discussions that came. I guess that's the reason why I came back here, just to kind of infill myself again. But the reality is I have, over the last 39 or so years, uh, worked on 197 towns in a public participation process that essentially involves an intensity of visual responses, people responding to the characteristics of place. Now, what is so fascinating about it is that the majority of things that the American people want, and it's called designed by democracy, are things they can't have. And they can't have because of zoning. They can't have because of uh, the big eight corporate influences on what American structure is going to be. But I will tell you from uh, what my almost lifetime's worth of experiences is, that there is a pent up demand by the American public to want something different than what they currently have. And it particularly, the damnation, it seems to be in the same line of cert from years back that it is still this issue of suburban, suburban sprawl, mindless highways, uh, a continuous of what I would call a depression state that people get in by exposing themselves over and over and over uh, to what is called the American landscape. So what I'm suggesting is, is that, and I following up with what this young lady just talked about, 
I don't think there has been a vision for America, what America wants to become until 1939. Certainly, the new urbanism has really done a phenomenal job of pulling up something in this respect, and that's been great. But we haven't had a vision of what America will become since 39. And, and I don't under, I mean, this is a wonderful room, all enclosed, no walls, no TVs. Uh, and you're going, in order for us to propagate a vision of what the future is going to be, we need to capitalize on what the rest of the whole world is capitalizing on. And that is a vision that needs to be presented to the world in a way that the world can understand it. And through a media that people really need to explore. So I would suggest that with all the brains in this room and all the brains at Harvard and all the brains at all the best universities to try to see if we could somehow or another generate a vision of what this future would be for people. And I think it's got to be not to a point where it's at this level here, but it's got to be understandable by the average American out there if we're to be successful. Thank you, Tony. I think, Charles, did you have your... Thank you. Uh, Don Gunberg, and March 73, and an earlier undergraduate experience here. I want to uh, make a comment that tries to end as a challenge, but also goes back to the reflections of the chron almost chronological uh, flow we had in the first panel yesterday. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I became very bonded to the GSD through an, a senior advisor. And somehow, it was mostly the urban design faculty and students more than the architects. And it had an enormous influence on me as a 18, 19, 20 year old, as, an, as a young kid who felt uh, th th there was a world out there and a bigger picture, and it really underlied uh, how I approached Harvard as, a, as an architect. But when I go back to my dorm, I had three roommates. I was in total isolation. They had no idea what I did, what I was interested in. And um, I think that gap still exists. And Dean and I have talked about the opportunity and challenge that lies of the dialogue that we're struggling over the last three panels to develop the vocabulary and how we talk to each other. I think great progress has been made. I think architects and landscape architects, urban designers, planners have beginning to bridge those gaps. But that's 5% of the problem. We really need to reach out to the public that is within this university and our future clients who are as futurists as we are, the doctors and lawyers businessmen are thinking about paradigms for what they're going to do in 5 and 10 and 20 years and how society is changing. So we don't have a monopoly on thinking about the future and the opportunities of building those bridges are there. So that's sort of my challenge uh, that grows out of a very positive experience of connecting to the GSD and I remember Sultan drawing us in Robinson Hall to the window looking out at Boylston Hall and said, get out of this building, go see the city, go learn French. And we didn't understand why then, but we do now. Uh, the same challenge, I think, occurs now, and I see it as a great opportunity. Great, thanks, Don. Um, Greg Baldwin, it's not worth standing up. This is a modest observation. Um, uh, <laughs> back to the comment, though, on learning from our mistakes. Obviously, I think we should... Uh, uh, learn from our mistakes, but I am concerned that if promise is to d be defined um, by eliminating mistakes, that design runs the risk of becoming simply uh, an atonement, an act of atonement for the sins committed. Let's uh, continue this way, I think, sir. Go ahead. This guy has um, which Hai Tantrati would MAUD 73 from Thailand. I fly all the way here. Anyway, um, some six, seven years ago, the Thai government um, proposed that um, the um, licensing of the professional practices in architecture, landscape architecture, interior design, and physical city planning, which you know, to our understanding is uh, urban design. I understand this country still has not uh, introduced this uh, licensing of urban design practice. And after 50 years in existence, um, especially at, at GSD, why is still not considered as a profession or not? Because, you know, um, from, from what I heard for this past one and a half days, um, it's not really considered as a profession. It's more like a, 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 a cooperation of, of different uh, professional practices. So uh, anyway, that's my comment, whether it should be licensing or not. 
One only licenses professions that can do damage to people and cities and conditions. No, 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 it's, a, it's an interesting question, of course. Uh, Gil? Um, Gil Kelly, uh, urban planner and a Globe Fellow here at GSD last year. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge, I think there's one limitation in the conversation that we keep bumping up against and are not very explicit about, which is to uh, define uh, urban design and planning as the same thing. Um, or that essentially planning is the act of an architect or a landscape architect working at a bigger scale or working on the design of the public realm. Um, and I think that leads us to the inevitable um, outcome that why, why don't the things we conceive of actually get built and why don't people understand them? Um, because it's conceived of as the designer and everyone else. Um, and <clears throat> I think the planning profession is actually broader than simply the design set of uh, skills and tools and something that I experienced here uh, at GSD, as, as powerful as the design program is here, I think the connections with the other planning uh, sub-disciplines are sort of lacking and I find that a bit absent in the conversation uh, here as well. Um, and I, I think it could be uh, an enriching um, experience for both students here uh, and for these kinds of conferences to conceive of planning as a broader set of disciplines. As important as the design impulse and the design approach is, um, what you really need to do to engage uh, the public is not simply have the designer and a sort of uh, standardized uh, uh, citizen engagement process, but to actually engage other disciplines and other knowledge that are helping to solve the same problem that the designer is trying to approach, uh, but from other uh, points of view and with other skills. Gil, you were a director of planning for Portland, Oregon for how many years? About, about 10 years, nine. Okay. Thanks. Anne Renahan, I was a graduate from Master, Gropius's master class in 1950. I also had the very good fortune of being able to attend the Siam Congress, the first Siam Congress after the war in 1948, where there was Le Corbusier, Gideon, Gropius, Sert, all the big names of the profession were there. <laughs> after six, seven years of silence during the war. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, but first of all, urban design did not start 50 years ago. The philosophy of urbanism started at Siam Congress in 1948. And when I sat in the audience and just listened, I had a sense at the Siam Congress that there was a philosophy. Everybody had, whether it was Gideon spoke or Le Corbusier, but everybody had deep, deep philosophy, which they've expressed, which they had developed during the suffering of during the war. And I hate to say it, but listening and watching everything that happened this morning, I have a sense that you're playing with computers. It's a game you're playing. And I have one big question. What would you do without computers? Uh, Adele, Adele, did you have your hand up? Or, okay, okay. Uh, How about back further? Yeah, well, Bill Doble has had his hand up uh, over there, and then we'll continue back, so. Well, this is just a very uh, modest observation. Uh, it seems to me that uh, one of the big influences on urbanism and therefore on urban design has been the abolition of geography and distance as a social phenomena. Uh, that is, that if one looks at one's friends and colleagues, uh, you find that they are all over the world, and the assumption of urbanism is that the people that you want to relate with are people who are in a geographic uh, neighborhood, whereas all of the trends, which I certainly don't have to mention here, uh, of people living where relationships extend across uh, uh, 
uh, with, uh, with very little regard for geography, as in fact in this meeting itself, uh, where you have uh, people here who are relating to each other and will continue to relate to each other after the conference, uh, not in any physical geographic sense, uh, but through all the meetings of, of uh, interchange which uh, now exist. And so therefore, if one looks at some of the underlying assumptions that if you wanted to have interesting interchange with people, you go down to your local plaza or square or whatever it may be, uh, seems to me losing some validity. People, mothers with two-year-olds and four-year-olds might find that very valuable, and I'm not extending it to everyone, but I think for a certain number of people, you find interesting people by uh, uh, going on the internet, by uh, corresponding, by doing all the other things and that the people you're really interested in uh, may very well be in Beijing or Singapore or uh, Rotterdam uh, and uh, not around the corner. And this really uh, is a fundamental change in the nature of urbanism. It's going, been going on for a long time, uh, but focusing on physical space, which I think is quite proper and has been exciting to uh, hear about that here, uh, that physical and geographic space are far less relevant uh, in our day than uh, they have been, even in the 1950s, uh, where travel and communication uh, were so much more limited than they are now. Great, thanks, Bill. Okay, which are who? Are I'm Christine Carlisle. I graduated in uh, I guess 91 from the MAUD. And um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the whole notion that, and this is a very inspiring environment, and it's always great to come back here, but that there could be uh, a, 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 a description of, of a loss of public space, and that might be the way we're progressing. Um, it, I guess I'm a humanist, and we still occupy our bodies and our places and where we live, and to be able to give up on that is horrible. <laughs> And I just, I just can't imagine that we would not have that as our, our realm no, ever, no matter where we live. So it's just, for me, it's a, it's a very important thing, and I hope everyone keeps it in the way they work. Thank you. Um, so back there, I think, Alex, you were saying, the gentleman in the white shirt, please identify yourself. Stand up. Hi. <clears throat> Ricardo de Pirro. I graduated MAUD in uh, 1990. Uh, I just wanted to, to sort of uh, talk a bit about informal development, which which we we work a lot on in Mexico, and uh, perhaps seventy percent of Mexican cities were actually built uh, informally, um, and we are now beginning to address the problem in Africa and certain areas of Asia, and it seems to me that um, w we need all of us to dedicate a lot of our sort of skills to. Uh, dealing with problems where there are no existing structures of power, there is no formal structure of government uh, that is has uh, exercising dominion over a region. You can't even organize a community meeting. So simply, uh, let's say, um, somehow uh, the government permits a community uh, community to uh, gather and make decisions about its future. Uh, where we work, a lot of the times, there's <clears throat> there's no such authority. Informal development, uh, which I think characterizes the large uh, majority of urban development in the world today, um, is not about formal power structures. Uh, there are no, uh, let's say, formal companies that build it. Uh, uh, there's no uh, government authority that mitigates, let's say, the relationship between the designers and um, the, the public. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of thinking that needs to go on. There's just uh, a, a need to evaluate how organic systems work, how humanity is actually capable of making very good cities without a plan. Uh, we just keep finding that uh, when, you, when you compare informal uh, neighborhoods to formal worker housing, for example, 30 years later, the informal neighborhoods, the houses sell for more money. Uh, the worker housing uh, usually drops in value, and uh, the informal houses are worth more once some sort of, uh, uh, let's say, tenure is achieved. But um, it, it was a, sort of an absent subject uh, the last two days, although this has been extremely inspiring. Uh, 
and I, I think that as a comment to, to all of us, there's this humongous world of uh, urban uh, sort of development which is not uh, involved in formal structures and, and I think it requires a lot of input to influence it somehow. I'm not even sure how we would achieve that. Uh, thank you. Um, let's go here and then over to there. We have 10 minutes left, I've been told by Alex. Um, is this on? Okay. Uh, I um, am c um, concerned about the loss of prestige of architects and urban designers. And, um, and I think that the comment that was made earlier about it's more important to let community be involved in a way uh, um, where they know what uh, what can be done, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, um, what community thinks they want. Um, that uh, is a, a good way of um, uh, changing or uh, putting more emphasis on uh, how. Um, we communicate to the uh, world, the public in general. I think we have been talking too much among ourselves, and so the public doesn't know what the value of design is. And uh, uh, there, as we know, there have been many mistakes. But um, I think uh, maybe what, one way to uh, recover some of the prestige of architects is to um, have a something like a Hippocratic oath for architects to do no harm. So. Uh, yes, sir, and then David Lee, and then. Uh, my name's Dennis Carlone. Uh, I was here in the mid 70s in architecture and urban design. Uh, loved the program. Uh, I thought it couldn't have been better for me because it gave us a broad base of different professional information that we could use to uh, move forward on a plan. I worked on the East Cambridge Riverfront plan, the Lechmere Canal area, with Roger for 30 years and helping implement that. And what I learned was that the tools we got out of school, and in particular, learning to work with community, and I agree, uh, were absolutely key. And when I say community, it isn't just the neighborhood. It's the politicians. It's the state funding. It's getting them excited about the ideas, uh, creating an urban space, not owning, the city owned none of the land, and still creating an urban infrastructure uh, and getting buildings to work together was really based on integrating all the information we learned and quite frankly, being one-on-one -on -one with people. And um, I haven't heard much of that said uh, today, but it is all we do. We have a very noble profession, and the more public-minded that is, and the less personal ego it is, uh, the more noble it is. Uh, David Lee, please. Welcome back, David, a long-standing faculty member in the Urban Planning and Design Department. Yeah, and I was a student back in uh, a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> when, David? Uh, 1971, when, Mark uh, UD, 1971. And, um, you know, on some levels, I, I think we're also working around the edges, too. It seems to me that we are a nation in crisis right now, socially, economically, and in every other kind of way. And it seems to me that urban design, you know, somebody said, it, I think as a nation right now, we're lacking imagination and we're lacking ambition. When I came here in the 70s, when Tony Nellison and Roger and a lot of people here, Bill Doble, uh, you know, we believed we could do anything. And now I don't know what's happened to that. I mean, we talk about a stimulus package. I mean, who's going to remember 30 years from now that we gave tax breaks to somebody as opposed to built the Hoover Dam or the interstate highway system or some other kind of thing? And it seems to me that as urban designers, what we need to do is find some kind of way to make this a national agenda item. You cannot rebuild a bridge over the Charles River in Mumbai. You have to do it here. 
Somebody has to have a job. Somebody has to buy a sandwich. Somebody has to buy construction boots and all of those kinds of things. And I think we really have to, have to step up politically and somehow get the attention of this administration to rebuild and to rebuild with a purpose as the young lady who was at the CIM thing uh, uh, said, there was a commitment to an idea there. And what is lacking right now is a real narrative, a real idea, and a real commitment to bring the kinds of skills that we have to the forefront that I think could benefit this country as a whole. David, are you thinking about seriously uh, entering politics? I I'm quite serious. <laughs> That's, that's no longer a disqualification. <laughs> My name is Ben Lau. Uh, I'm an airport planner, an airport designer, and I got into that profession through the encouragement of Wilhelm von Moltke and Ken Zetangi. Well, before I start, I just want to say that after listening to this presentation this morning, I felt that I must be very old because if I were to be a politician, a decision maker, I can't figure out what people are trying to say. I can't really figure out what, are you try what kind of solution are you trying to convey. When I came here in the 70s, I was privileged to study under Professor Doble, Roger Transick, Antoine Nelson, and Ken Sutangi and Wilhelm Malmalki. We talk about movements, people, transportation, migration in and out of the city. And during that time period, since I graduated from the school to the time period here, we saw one city, Shenzhen, which somebody presented, that em emerged from nothing, from a swamp land, from zero to 13 million in 30 years. But the migration pattern, for example, has to be talked about. How they sold the city is something uh, kind of unique, because in the daytime, they had 13 million people. Uh, in, uh, in nighttime, the pattern changed to nine million people because people migrate in and out of the city. Those are the kind of things that I learned when I was in school here because people were talking about that. You know, Wilhelm von Malky, for example, told me that urban design and urban planning is how you want to define it. When I came to ask for his advice whether I should go into airport planning, he said, precisely, you should do that and more people should get involved in transportation. Because the city starts with a gateway to, uh, urban planning starts with a gateway to a city. Because city evolves from seaports, train station, and airports. So you have to look at urban design well, in the macro scale as well as the micro scale. And Kenzo Tangi said the same thing when I went to visit his office in Tokyo. He said, hope you can convince people in the profession architects, urban design, urban planner, to expand the reach. You can go to the micro level and you go to the macro level. And I hope you keep on focusing on the human elements, focus on how they live, whether it's one million people, 100,000, or 10 million people. You got to focus on the, on the micro detail in order to solve the macro, in order to provide the macro solution. Thank you. You, uh, you had your hand up there. Yes, sir. Right, yes. Please stand up. Thank you. Guillermo Aguilar, 79. Uh, when I came here, um, I already had my degree in architecture. And I was interested in the relationship between buildings and the urban form. And I quick realized that urban design was too complicated. Too many innovations from politicians and real estate developers and a whole agenda that was foreign to design. And the emphasis at GSD in 79s was design. We had Peter Walker in landscape architecture, Jerry McHugh in uh, the architectural studio, uh, uh, mostly uh, Safdi in urban design, and it was all about design. Now, moving forward, I think most of our practice is not design, but is dealing with politicians, dealing with um, growth of, in the cities, uh, dealing with huge impacts where we were not prepared for. I applaud the presentation this morning. I think experimentation in the schools is critical because it gives us a discipline 
it gives us an intellectual motivation to challenge our clients. Uh, I think it is uh, important that we stand with our principles when we are dealing with politicians and the communities as well, so that we can educate them. But at the same time, I think we need to get more engaged with, uh, with the cities. Uh, yesterday, a little bit, I think I said that we are um, transforming ourselves into the 21st century with a lot of pains. You know, we have a lot of issues with security, with transportation, with uh, migration. Uh, China is going to build 50,000 miles of high-speed rail in the next 10 years. Think about the impact that that's going to create in the cities in, in China and so on and so forth. So our challenges are tremendous. Uh, so this is just a statement. I think uh, you know the schools have to continue experimenting. They have to continue challenging themselves. New ideas, ideas have to be there in the forefront. And we, this is up to us now to take those ideas to our clients and try to stake our position there and live with the challenges. Okay, thank you. The person right behind you, I think, had, then we'll do Bill. Uh, well, Alex, you're the ultimate timekeeper here. I'm just the functionary timekeeper. Uh, so what about, there are several other people. Just raise your hands if you still want to say something. All right, so you tell me what to do, Alex. Five minutes, but we should, it's been a long time since our little measly breakfast and lunch is waiting, so just a couple more. And uh, there's another session, obviously, after lunch, so please, a yeah, couple more. Go ahead. Okay, so... I'm Stephen Gray, MAUD08. Um, I just wanted to sort of ask a more pedagogically pointed question. Um, and I just want to start from the prof professional sort of perspective. Um, there have been a lot of changes, economic changes are sort of at the forefront right now in our profession. Um, and at the same time, you know, there's this move towards integrated design and the integrated approach in offices where you have everyone involved from the sort of the start of a project. And so the, the coincidence of sort of an economic crisis where we're trying to keep our jobs every day at a minimum um, and this integrated approach is that the economic side of it is pushing a need for the integrated approach even further, both from a client perspective in terms of um, needing a more holistically effective project from, um, from their consultants, but also from a consultant perspective in order to streamline our process and make projects more economically beneficial to, to our office. And the overlap uh, and cross-pollination of this in the workplace um, seems to point to me a need more than, than ever uh, for a more distinct and focus, focused uh, academic pedagogical thrust um, in terms of professional identity um, and professional tra trajectory. Uh, my, my office has recently gone through a structural change from a sort of discipline layout to a studio layout where we work by sector instead of by discipline. And it's been really great for the work that we produce and sort of the, the internal um, collaboration that didn't exist as much before that. But at the same time, we're really struggling hard to uh, retain our disciplinary identities and, and in terms of professional development and mentorship. Um, and so we've heard a lot, a lot uh, of reference to the view that the formulaic as a result of consensus, as a mixed use, this and that, is overall uninteresting uh, as it ends in itself to most of us. And so it concerns me that the absorbing of urban design into uh, a, a sort of pedagogical realm of landscape urbanism as a philosophy, uh, not just at Harvard, but in the way that we work in an integrated approach, um, becomes just that, a result of consensus. An urban design, mixed use, this and that. Uh, one that may have lost pedagogy and clarity, um, and I think it's necessary for us to have a strength of identity in the profession, and so I'd like to hear more discussion on that later. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Two more people. Uh, yes, all the way back, Charles. Um, Charles Norris. Uh, uh, Master of Architecture in 68, uh, Master of Urban Design in uh, 69. Incidentally, the smallest urban design class, a class of two in the year that it was transitioning from one year to, to two years. I was, we were stuck in between. Um, a couple of quick comments. Uh, sometimes uh, we're accused of uh, stating the obvious, but um, having attended a number of the urban design conferences um, from the 60s through the 70s, 
Um, and, and certainly hearing about, you know, the importance of the CM conference in, 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 in 1948, uh, I would suggest that uh, one thing that has given identity to urban design over the years is, is some sense of coming together, uh, not just as a group here at Harvard, but coming together as a, an international group of urban designers. And I would suggest some thought given to uh, reviving uh, either uh, the Urban Design Conference or a broader perspective, a CM conference in the future. I think uh, aside from the notion of having a professional license and so on and so forth, there's also an importance of having some periodic uh, renewal of identity. Um, the second uh, point I'd like to put forward as a challenge to everyone, we've all taken different paths and there have been some fascinating conversations about where we're going in the next 50 years, but I think uh, for those of us who have been practicing for almost 40 years now uh, and less, uh, it would be a good challenge for us to try and jot down uh, some aspects of our journey that we think are, in fact, relevant to the future, um, maybe both personally uh, and possibly being collected as a group so that we, we get some benefit from our collect collective experience. I don't think there's any one discipline that has dominated, indeed, on many projects you have to make a decision about which discipline might be dominant. And I, I think there are many lessons to be learned from that. Um, again, thanks for the uh, simulating uh, conversation and, and uh, dialogue, and um, we hope that it, uh, it continues. Well, um, I think, uh, I'm sorry to, to others. Uh, we have, I have been instructed, reached the end of our time. I have uh, one question for Alex, and I must admit it's been somewhat frustrating for me to sit here and not be able to comment as well, but that that was my role, I guess a, a true planner, right? Uh, except that's not what planning should be and hopefully isn't what planning is. Alex, how, how should the audience, because we've heard a variety of critiques, uh, how should they understand uh, the conference up till now and then the rest of the conference? Because obviously there's one more missing piece uh, to it. Uh, is this presenting the entire world of urban design? Uh, is it going to finally have presented it? How do you, could you just frame the conference, I think? Because that's part of the questions that have come up um, and for the rest of the day. Uh, <clears throat> Well, actually, what's been rewarding for me in the past 45 minutes is that we've gone from reflections to challenges to experiments to passions. Uh, we've gone to passions, which is a very important thing to have uh, if you're going to start to change the world. Uh, so uh, now, after some fine dining, <laughs> we'll go on to positions uh, and see uh, whether those passions could be extended to kind of very specific uh, uh, points of view about where uh, the discipline has been and where, in fact, it is uh, maybe uh, trajectories is uh, in the future. Uh, this conference is not meant to be somehow comprehensive. Uh, in fact, uh, Raul Maholtra, who's the next chair of the department, I'm sorry, the current chair of the department, <laughs> will, will, <laughs> will initiate, uh, is, it initiates a, a year-long effort uh, as part of, of course, his taking command, a year-long effort in thinking about the future of the urban design program uh, and uh, the future of the urban planning program. In fact, the department combines both. So, uh, Gil, the department combines both. Uh, let me also just say, and, and not to kind of argue with, the, again, the young lady from, uh, uh, from 43 or 48, uh, we were not trying to uh, identify the origins of urban design. We would have to go back to, you know, Pope Sixtus V, or maybe Vitruvius, or maybe Inhoptep back in Egypt. Uh, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the founding of the first formal academic degree program that focused on this issue. Uh, nor do we try to encompass uh, the world of urban design. Uh, this session is hopefully trying to kind of open it up further, even as we try to establish certain positions uh, for the curriculum ahead. So thank you so far. Please come back. Food is over there. Uh, the seats are over there when you were here about the wheelwright. And please come back, back here at 2 o'clock for the positions uh, 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 panel.